Hi there, and a very warm welcome to this week's quick tip about nested dielectrics. Well, I think I could say it's more like a quickish tip because it's a lot of ground to cover. And I might call it Octane Essentials or something like that, because I'm covering the essentials of Octane Renderer through the last couple of weeks now. This week's tutorial was suggested by Arson Wallace, so hopefully I'm not butchering his name. Uh, thank you for the suggestion. So I hope that shows I'm doing my best to get the suggestions of the community into tutorials and hopefully you'll find that useful as well. So I've made this small, very untidy rendering here where I can see a shot glass that has some liquid in it. Of course, you would have been able to do that beforehand, but with nested dielectrics, stuff has gone a bit more easy if you know how to use it. So first of all, before we jump into 3D, let me bring out some slides and explain to you how nested dielectrics is working and what you have to look out for. So let's start first with what happens in the real world. If you pour a bit of water into a glass, the atoms of the glass and the water are touching and therefore there's a boundary condition between those volumes. So what's special about that? Not that much, but when light uh, enters a medium, it usually is refracted. That means the light rays are bent and the factor at which the light is bent occurs by something that's called Snell's law. So let's go over Snell's law real quick. So since I don't know how to program stuff like that, I've done that in uh, Expresso. So this is something that shows you what is happening with light when it enters a material of a certain density. So this is the light ray here hitting the surface of the material. And of course, it's a transparent material, so light can enter in. And it is refracting here, so the light is not going straight through, but it is bent. And the way it is bent is calculated by Snell's law. So if you change the density of the material the light is entering, the angle of the bending is changing. So if you, for example, set it to 1, that means the light is entering from air, which has a density of 1, into a medium that also has a density of 1. So nothing changes because the light is not doing anything. So there's nothing at the boundary condition where the light enters into so nothing changes. And if you have a very high ND, for example, like diamond 2.4, the light bending is very severe. This factor is actually the factor that light slows down inside of the medium and that causes the light to bend. Now, of course, also the angle has an effect on that. So the more angular the light is hitting towards the surface here, the more it is refracted. And this is exactly what also happens, not only if the light is hitting the glass, so the IOR here would be from 1 to 1 1.5, so there is Snell's law taking effect, but also in between boundary conditions. So if the light leaves the glass and enters the water. Then this boundary condition here is from an IOR 1.5 to an IOR 1.33. So it goes lower. So there's different things happening if the light is entering a higher or denser medium or if it's leaving a medium into a less dense medium. In this tutorial, that should be short, I'm not going over all the formulas and what you could do to make this without nested dielectrics. But as we have nested dielectrics, I'm telling you that nested dielectrics, if you're using it right, can take care of all of that and you end up with a realistic result with the right math. So next slide. So if you have seen the boundary condition here, you might think, well, let's do the same in 3D. Well, that's not a good idea. You've done something right and this is uh, oriented to normals to the outside for the glass and the water. But right now the polygon boundaries of the water are intersecting or are on the exact same plane as of the glass. And this is a bad idea because when the ray is hitting that boundary, 
it is by chance whether it goes into the glass medium or hits the water. So it's more or less a random chance what is happening and therefore you can get flickering in your animations or inaccurate result if you're just rendering a still. So the better way to go about that or doing that if you're not using nested dielectrics is to scale out the water body inside of the glass slightly. The thinner the intersection is, the better, but you have to account for that the renderer only has this much precision. So it's better to get a little bit further in than to have set fighting again. So when the light is hitting the glass, it produces the right reflection, the right refraction, and then it goes on inside of the glass and suddenly it hits the water instead of the glass surface that leads outside. So the ray is dumb and it doesn't know it's inside of a glass right now. So it calculates the reflection from air to glass. So from an IOR of 1 to an IOR of 1.33. And therefore you get a much too strong reflection inside. So sometimes it can even look nice to have that. But it's not how things are working and looking in reality. So let's move on to a step further. So if you do work with nested dielectrics, you don't have to care that the overlap here is as small as possible. As long as the water is not sticking outside of the glass here, you can do as large as you want. And then there's priorities. And this is the key step for nested dielectrics. So you can say the glass has a higher priority than the water. And what the renderer then is doing is as long as the ray is inside of the glass, it is ignoring the water. So it's nothing is happening when it notices that there is some polygons in here. It just ignores them. And it travels further until there is the boundary condition of the outer side of the glass. And when it hits this boundary condition, it does the right math to convert the IOR of 1.5 to the IOR of 1.33 and applies that to the boundary condition where the glass is ending. Obviously, you can do it the other way around too. So you can cut out the water out of the glass, but you should always check that the glass is the one with a higher priority. Okay, so let's do this in practice. I have prepared a scene here with a glass, of course, as we've talked about glasses. So right now we have the glass itself and there's no big secret about that. It's just a lathe nerves and a SDS object. And then we have the fluid and the fluid also is um, like we saw in the presentation before intersecting the glass. And we don't have to care about how far the fluid reaches inside of the glass because, as I've said, there's priorities. So the fluid in the rendering will only go to the glass wall here. So let's finally have a look in our scene here. So if I go to the glass material, for example, you can see in the common tab, there is the priority. So you can set the priority from a value of 100 to a value of minus 100. And I think that gives you more than enough possibilities to have stuff intersecting and stuff like that. One small word of caution here. If you bring in old scenes, the nested dielectric tick in your um, octane settings might not be turned on. This is, of course, for legacy reasons. So your scene renders the same way as it always has. With newer scenes, this should be ticked, but just check if you want to do something with nested dielectrics. Otherwise, the settings you do in the priority will not have any result. Okay, so let's start rendering here and see what we get. Right away, you can see the intersection of the glass and the fluid is uh, not looking that great. And this is exactly the reason why before that, when we didn't have nested dielectrics, we wanted to have this edge here that reaches out inside of the glass as small as possible. But with nested dielectrics, let's go just to our glass and set it to a higher priority. And you can see immediately this is taken care of. 
So now our fluid only takes effect when the glass inside wall ends. Obviously, if we want to do the wrong way around too, we can set this to minus one. And now the boundary condition is rendered accurately, but the fluid is caving inside of the glass, which isn't correct, obviously. So let's take that and put it to plus one again. Now I took the glass and put a small air bubble inside of here, down here. So let's activate that when we go to objects and then to glass and then the air bubble and turn it on. You can see if I go to the air bubble here and solo it, it's there, but it's not actually rendering here. And of course, this has something to do with priorities. So in the past, you would have gone in here and make this editable and reverted the normals to look inside and would have assigned the same class material than the class. But with nested dielectrics, there's another workflow. So I made this air material here. So what is an air material? It's not a new material. It's just a basic specular material that I have set the index to one. And if you remember from before, the index of air is index of one. So basically that's an air material. How do I make this show up here? Very easy. It just has to have a higher priority than the glass. So right now the glass has a priority of one. So we make this air a priority of two. And voila, it shows up and it has the right boundary condition because the renderer knows that this is air and it goes from the glass to the air surface or the air volume and therefore calculates the right boundary condition. All right, I'm going to do the Steve Chops here and say there's one more thing, and this is the Octane Clipping Material. You can get this by Materials, Create, Clipping Material here. And I'm talking about this material because it has also priorities. So when you get the material here, its standard priority is 100. And there seems to be a bug, so I can only go to as low as zero, not minus 100. So uh, what I did here, I have gone into all materials and raised the priority to 50. And once I've done that, I've gone into those materials and set those priorities according again. So below 50. And then I made a cube here. And this cube is halfway intersecting with a glass. And when I put the clipping material on here, you can see that now the glass is cut in half and we can see the fluid and the glass and the ice cube are all um, showing up as intended. So let me just go and move my camera again so you can have a better look here. You can see that the glass here is now cut. And when I move the cube, you can see that the cube now dictates where the clipping plane is. So I've set up uh, the other materials to higher than 50 because when I would have the cube intersecting, for example, the floor, and the floor would have a lower priority than the cube, let's say the cube has 51, obviously the cube then also creates a hole in the floor and every other object in the scene. So this is not what we want. We want the scene to be intact, but the glass to be cut. Now there's a small gripe here, and I wish there was something we could do about it. But since this is using the same priority, you can you remember that the water has lower priority than glass. So if I just wanted to clip the glass away and leave the fluid in, we couldn't do that because the fluid is always a lower priority than the class. And this one here cannot have a lower priority than class to clip it away. Hopefully that still gives you some ideas to do stuff. And I find that very interesting what you could do with the new Octane versions. So, uh, for example, technical animations and stuff like that uh, are 
a lot more easy than before with that technique here. So the only problems with that are again the same as if you have the fluid and the glass on the same plane. Then Octane doesn't know what to render first and whether the clipping material has priority or the actual polygons. So when you do that, take care about that so you don't have polygons directly on top of each other. And that concludes my tutorial. Thank you very much for watching and happy prioritizing.